Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Good morning. The technology I'm about to share with you is set to revolutionize the way that we generate and use energy on this planet. It has the capacity to do things that no other form of energy generation can do, and I'm very proud to say that after several years of hard work, my team and I are about to make it a reality. <sighs> Space-based solar power, a term we're going to be hearing a lot more of as we close out this decade, and by the end of this talk, I'm sure you'll understand why. The solar industry today is a $40 billion a year market producing 20 gigawatts of power. Unfortunately, that's less than one-tenth of one percent of the energy we currently demand. With our variants, it's usually generated the same way. We put solar panels either on the ground or on rooftops where every night it gets dark. They wait for the sun to rise and then harness whatever energy they can before the sun sets. Not only do we have the day-night cycle, which guarantees intermittency, but what about clouds and weather and different variants on gradients of latitude? But what if there was a way you could actually harness the power of the sun 24 hours a day and be able to capture that and use it in a way that provided the holy grail of renewable energy, baseload solar power? Well, we can do that. By taking solar panels and putting them into a geosynchronous orbit, we have the technology to be able to convert that electricity into a transferable radio, sequence, uh, radio frequency, send it back down to Earth with pinpoint accuracy, safely and reliably, to create constant energy generated by the sun 24 hours a day. Now, that question has always been asked of space-based solar power. Can it really be done? Yeah. And if so, how? The questions now really come, have been centering on, yeah, when will it be done? And who's going to be first? I'd like to answer that by saying space energy and now. But before I get into some of the details, I'd like to share with you some of the history. Like every great idea that has the power to change the world, space-based solar power was thought of way ahead of its time, when back in 1968, a renowned scientist, Peter Glaser, first proposed the concept. In the 70s, NASA did some studies and tests to verify that the physics of wireless power transmission worked and that we understood the technology. More studies done in the 80s and then a fresh look in the 90s all drew the same conclusion, that yes, space-based solar power is technically feasible. We know how to do this. The challenge has never been technology. The challenge has always been economics. Being able to make the business case close is what's prevented this from happening today. And the first company to be able to do that wouldn't just start a business, but it would launch an industry. Let's fast forward, 2006, something happened. Uh, a paper came out written by Lieutenant Colonel Michael Hornacek of the US Air Force uh, called War Without Oil. And what it did, it centered on the impending challenges we face as we enter an area of depleting hydrocarbons known as peak oil. It also projected a scenario out 15 years or so from today where the world could get very easily drawn into an all-out global conflict over the last remaining scraps of non-renewable energy. That scenario was taken quite seriously by the National Security Space Office of the Pentagon, whose job is to actually mitigate war prevention uh, and look for different solutions that can actually take us on peaceful paths. They decided to look around at what technology or what directions we could take that would avoid this potential scenario, and everywhere they looked, the same thing that kept coming up to the front, space-based solar power. So they went over to NASA and they said, hey, is space-based solar power real and are we doing it? And NASA turned back to the Pentagon and said, well, yes, it is real, it can be done, but that's energy and we do space, not energy. So the Pentagon then went to the Department of Energy and said, well, yeah, space-based solar power, we understand it's real, are we doing it? And the Department of Energy turned around to the Pentagon and said, space what? Yeah, we do energy, not space. So in order to find out and ask, you know, ask the question, is it real and does the promise it hold, is it viable? The Pentagon decided to do their own study, and they enrolled 170 of the world's top experts. And they produced that study, and it was released on October the 10th, 2007. And the conclusions are very clear. Yes, space-based solar power is possible. Yes, the promise it holds is enormous, and the time to start doing it is now. Hmm. So the credibility that that gave space-based solar power was enormous, but not only that, it actually earned the four co-authors of that study what's been called the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Space, the prestigious Space Pioneer Act Award. And this is them receiving it. Well, why all the fuss? Why all the urgency now? Well, I'd like to address that in two ways. One is to actually look at the energy crisis that we're currently facing. A lot of people understand that you know, we live in an energy-hungry and resource-poor world, or at least we're being accused of being poor on how we use the resources that we have. But I don't think we understand the magnitude of the enormity of the challenge we're facing. 
One man that does is this man, Mike Sneed, who, apart from being an expert in spacefaring logistics, is also a very proficient energy modeler. And last year, he wrote a very comprehensive report that asked the question, if we're to get off our addiction to hydrocarbon energy, then what would we need to replace that with? And what's the likeliest build-out scenario that we could actually match that up to? And he did that for the United States and the world in general. I'd like to share with you his scenario for the US, because it was quite, um, as I think you'll see, quite astounding, some of the stats. He proposed that if we just take the US, um, if the US was to build 70 new one gigawatt nuclear plants, if it was to build and install one million large wind turbines across 5,000 miles of coastline, if it was to add the equivalent of 15 extra Hoover dams to max out its hydro, if it was to upscale its geothermal capability by a factor of 50, if it was to collect all of the 2 billion tons of non-food biomass and use that per year, and in addition to all of that, if it was to build a staggering 60,000 square miles of ground-based solar, under that scenario, cumulatively, by 2100, not only would we not be able to provide even a third of the energy that we're likely to use, but if that happened today, we couldn't replace the fossil fuel usage in the US. Hmm. Well, that's the energy scenario. And I don't just want to talk about energy, because what I'd like to talk about you know, is the fact, yes, we need space-based solar power. We need it as a complement to every existing form of energy that we need to generate, invest in, and look forward to bringing online right now. It's not just the answer. But I want to talk about something that's far more important than energy. I'd like to talk about something, what I call the real promise of space-based solar power. Because let's just check in for a minute. We're talking about a technology that has the ability to transfer energy on demand anywhere on Earth in real time as it's needed, 24 hours a day. Nothing else can do that. The implications when we start assessing that are outstanding. They're, they're, they're absolutely astounding. If you take it from a humanitarian or an environmental perspective, I mean, the world governments, NGOs, the UN all understand that one of the fastest ways to take people out of poverty in the developing world is to give them access to electricity. That's why the World Bank has made it one of their mandates to make renewable and um, rural electrification one of their, I say, their high priorities. The challenge is that most of these areas that be affected the most can't get onto the grid. Space-based solar power could actually enable rural electrification like no other form of technology. And if we just focus on food and water for um, a second, I'll show you the implications of that. Well, one of our team recently met with one of the federal ministers in India that was in charge of food production, and he wanted to see us because he understood the implications of space-based solar power and what it could mean for rural electrification. But he shared with us some interesting information. He said that the reason that they have so much hunger in India is not down to food production. In fact, they produce all of the food in India they need to feed everybody in India. He said the biggest challenge and the reason they have so much hunger is that one-third of all the crops grown in India spoil from harvest to market because of lack of refrigeration. And if we were able to bring a technology that could put remote locations with energy so we could generate refrigeration, you'd have a massive impact on India's hunger almost overnight. If we take water, water is also a huge issue, uh, not only in the third world, where the World Health Organization uh, is very clear on the fact that lack of access to clean water is one of the biggest challenges and one of the largest causes of death, disease, and suffering in the third world. Things like cholera, typhoid, and specifically diarrhea are prevalent in areas that don't have access to clean water. Well, we can tackle this today with existing technology, something called atmospheric water generators. They take water out of the air and actually provide purified, sorry, they take um, uh, the air and make purified water. This uh, is the village of uh, Jalamundi in India, which this year became the first village in the world to have all of its water powered by the air. Now, we can put these units all over the third world and create massive, massive reductions in poverty and increases in quality of life. The biggest challenge as to why that doesn't happen is because those areas don't have access to power to make these machines work. Space-based solar power could have a, a huge impact on something like that. Most people understand that water is not just a third world issue, it's definitely a first world issue. Most governments that have access to coastlines are embarking on ambitious uh, desalination programs. Uh, with receding glaciers and falling water tables, we know that fresh water is going to be a, a big issue as we face the, uh, in the coming years ahead. Now, space-based solar power can help here because most people involved in desal understand that you know, the biggest uh, uh, desalination, it sucks enormous amounts of energy. It requires huge amounts of energy. Mm. Disaster relief. 
We have the ability today to put relief workers on the ground in a matter of hours almost anywhere in the world, whether it's hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes like last week in Indonesia. The challenge is not getting people there, the challenge is having power ready for them to be able to use their tools, where most of the infrastructure is usually knocked out. And I'm not even talking about some of the economic benefits of space-based solar power, including a quarter of a million jobs that um, you know, is likely to be generated in the US alone at a time where unemployment is the, uh, the highest for nearly a quarter of a century. Uh, the tens of thousands of jobs in the countries that can actually uh, uh, embrace and, and take the energy contracts for these satellites, mm, and we're talking to several. You know, the economic implications I could talk about for uh, uh, another hour. But uh, yeah, let's talk about, uh, let's uh, address one concern, which uh, we heard on the last video as well. Number one concern usually is safety. Well, we have a 50-year history now of being able to send up satellites powered by rockets into, the, um, uh, into orbit that are powered by solar panels that generate that uh, electricity converted into a radio wave and beam it back to Earth. It's called the communication satellite industry. And as a result of that, the last 50 years, everybody in this room today currently has the equivalent of the Library of Congress being broadcast through them every second. You'll be pleased to know that the physics of wireless power transmission are very well understood. They're well documented, especially by our team who understand all of the intricacies involved. It is safe. It is reliable. The beam transmission from the satellite to Earth is safe for humans, animals, and plants. In fact, the strongest part of the beam, the energy density, is weaker than natural sunlight. It comes down to a receiving antenna, which is like a large mesh wire grid on the floor. It's a simple technology, uh, and it's uninhabited. You compare that to a nuclear reactor on the ground, or a dust spewing coal plant, and I know which one I'd rather choose. Another factor to take into account, and the question we get asked is, can this be weaponized? Yeah, categorically, absolutely not. You couldn't weaponize a space-based solar power satellite any more than you could a satellite broadcasting CNN or Sirius radio. In fact, the reason the Pentagon did their study over the open internet for the first time ever was to assure people they were looking at ways to avert war, not trying to hide some clandestine new weapons program. Hmm. So, if we understand that it's safe, we understand the technology is uh, available, we understand it holds enormous promise for many different aspects of society as we move forward, then the only thing that was stopping it was the business case. So let's take a quick look at that for a second. Well, our calculations put the cost of the first one gigawatt satellite somewhere around $16 billion. Now that may sound a lot. It's certainly not going to come from something like the space tourism market, which is still in its infancy. But we're not in that market. We're in the energy market. $2 trillion a year and growing every day. Hmm. But if we just compare that to, for example, like a nuclear plant, I think you'll find the figures interesting. A nuclear plant today costs between four and six billion on the low end up to 10 billion on the high end, depending on which technology you use and whereabouts in the earth you decide to build it. That's for procurement and build out, engineering. If we then add in maintenance, operations, transmission, and fuel costs over the life of that plant, you could add another six or seven billion dollars. If we then take into account the UK government audit statistics saying that their latest costings for the decommissioning of the current plants here in the UK are coming in at $6 billion each, we end up with a, a lifetime cost of a nuclear plant anywhere from six, uh, 17 billion on the low end up to 23 billion on the high end. That makes space-based solar power competitive today. And the price of sunlight isn't going up, eh? unlike the cost of oil and uranium. Uh, and that's before we deal with the nuclear waste issues. And also, history has shown that over time, you know, the history uh, and costings of electronic components come down. I know there's a lot of uh, innovation in rocket technology and launch costs, which we said hopefully will reap the benefit of over the next five to ten years as well. Hmm. Is it profitable? Well, it's not going to happen unless it is. And the fleet of satellites that we intend to build cumulatively over their lifetime can put down over $210 billion worth of energy kind of puts a $16 billion figure into perspective. Hmm. So, well, that's what we think. Uh, what are the next steps? Well, we've spent the last two years and several million dollars building a world-class team and a solid foundation. Our next step is to launch a demonstrator into low Earth orbit to validate everything that we're speaking about here. And that will cost about $300 million. Again, put that into perspective. It's the same price as the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Hmm. Okay. From there, we expect to uh, close power purchase contracts, 
and off the back of that, we'll finance our first gigawatt satellite, and that will um, take about a five-year build-out, which incidentally is about the same time as a new nuclear power plant or coal plant on the ground today. Mm -hmm. So again, that's what we think. What do other people think? Well, this is uh, former president of India, President Kalam, who's also in charge of their space program for a few years. Understands space-based solar power and its implications and a big fan. He said, what better vision can there be for the future of space exploration than participating in a global mission for the perennial supply of renewable energy from space? Sir Richard Branson, also uh, involved in the space tourism industry right now, he says, I believe that someday we'll be able to use space as a source of energy for the planet through solar power satellites, using the most sustainable source available, our sun. George Freeman, a very respected futurist, just came out with this book for the next 100 years on the New York Times and Amazon bestseller list. He clearly states on the front cover of that that he thinks that space-based solar power will be the energy of choice as we move forward into this century. And then earlier this year, the large utility firm PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, on the west coast of the US, approached the California government for permission to sign a 200 megawatt power purchase agreement for energy delivered by space-based solar power starting around 2016, which falls in line with our timeframes. And I'm pleased to say that last month, the Japanese space agency and government, along with industry partners like Mitsubishi, announced they were investing $21 billion to build out their space-based solar power program over the next 30 or so years, starting with a one gigawatt satellite. See, space-based solar power is real, and it is happening today, and it is set to change the world. With the enormous promise and potential that it has for this planet, it has to. You see, it's time that we started to accept and embrace and acknowledge that space-based solar power is not only a clean and viable source of energy for the world, it's not only an inevitable technology that is happening, it's not only a profitable business venture, but more importantly, it offers a global solution to some of the most serious challenges that we've been facing ever in modern history. And we are proud and excited to be a part of it. Thank you.